40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. 79-year-old Malcolm Summers still has the mailing business he had 40 years ago. On November 22, 1963, he drove down to the old downtown post office to drop off some mail. Knowing the presidential motorcade was nearby, the Republican, who voted for Kennedy, walked over to Elm Street and stood right here, opposite the grassy knoll. He heard the shots, the first louder than the next, and so on. I thought someone had threw a firecracker down on the ground just to be smart. But then they came, the procession kept coming, and then the second and the third shot rang out. Well, I knew it was being shot at. I knew that was what was happening. And then... The car got right beside me where I was at, and it actually stopped momentarily. And I heard Jackie Kennedy say, oh, God, no, no. And I uh, heard John Conley say they're going to shoot us all. Summers, who can be seen in the Zapruder film, crossed over here to the grassy knoll. That's when he and several others started running to the railroad tracks, thinking the shooter was there. Summers then ran into the Secret Service agent, who never was. There was a, a gentleman in a, a suit and a hat and tie, and he had a gun over his a uh, raincoat, and I could only see the barrel of it. It was just, and he he said, uh, y'all better not come up here. And he wasn't only talking to me, it was other people running there. Uh, you can get shot. Summers later learned that there was no such federal agent that day. Weeks after the assassination, Summers became the target of telephone threats. Most assumed that's why he remained a silent eyewitness. Which wasn't the case at all. Was not even a factor. Malcolm Summers just didn't want to be bothered, but thanks to the urgings of his son, he says he realized the historical significance and importance of his trip to the post office 40 years ago. For JFK 40, I'm Ellie Hogue, WBAP 24 Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, the Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. Today he presides over U.S. District Court in Dallas. But in 1963, Judge Barefoot Sanders worked as a U.S. attorney and was involved in the activities surrounding President Kennedy's visit. I was against the visit, so when the vice president came to town, I told him I thought this was a terrible thing because of what had happened to Stevenson. U.N. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson was given pretty rude treatment during a visit here. He said, I think it is too, but he's coming, and we're going to make as much of a success of it as we can. This predominantly Republican area is rather notorious for its disregard of protocol. Sanders was riding in the motorcade through downtown Dallas, a few cars back from the presidential limousine. And I saw running across the street, a policeman looked to me like he had his gun drawn. And we could see the president's limousine barreling ahead of us. So I knew something was really wrong then. The judge says he eventually got a ride back to his office where the dreaded news arrived about the nation's 35th president. Word came that the president was dead. This bulletin from the WBAP newsroom. Here is David Daniel. President Kennedy is dead. Judge Barefoot Sanders says the view back over four decades lends a sense of perspective to the events of November 22nd, 1963. It changed. Changed Dallas. It was the end of the vocal right wing extremists. So far as what it did to our individual lives, I think people came to appreciate the grace and the wit and the flair that Kennedy had brought to the presidency. And they still talk about it and they still appreciate it. And that's true all over the world. U.S. District Judge Harold Barefoot Sanders, Jr. For JFK 40, I'm Rick Hadley, WBAP 24 Hour News. Listen. For JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people. 40 stories on News Talk 820 WBAP. 
When President Kennedy came to Dallas-Fort Worth in 1963, Joe Cody was a detective sergeant in the robbery theft division of the Dallas Police Department. Forty years ago, Cody says not everyone was enthusiastic about JFK's visit. I don't think it was hate for the president. I heard a lot of things about, you know, well, now I'm a Republican and he's a Democrat. That November 22nd, Cody was in the robbery theft division when word came in from a police chief. Someone had shot at the president. Cody jumped in a car and drove to the scene. I was the one walking along the curb and found a piece of his head bone. The President of the United States has been the victim of an assassination. <laughs> Later, Cody returned to the police department where they brought in a man and sat him down in his interrogation room. I said, what's your name? He said, Lee Harvey Oswald. I didn't shoot anybody, sir. I haven't been told what I'm here for. Cody also got in more than his share of hot water for a favor he did for a friend. He bought Jack Ruby the Colt Cobra Ruby used to kill Oswald two days after the president's death. He's been shot. Following Oswald's death, Cody visited Ruby in the county jail and asked him, why did you do it? He said, well, Joe, let me tell you something. He said, they'll be trying that case 20 years now. They'll spend a billion dollars on it. He said they won't now. Four decades after the worst weekend in Dallas history, Cody reflects on how the city and the police department have been maligned in the years following the assassination. I think that the police department did an excellent job investigating the case, and I have seen nothing in 40 years to change my view on how it happened. For JFK 40, I'm John Pendolino, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. For so many who were in downtown Dallas on that afternoon, November 22nd, 1963 was a typical day in a typical place. I was a salesman for a motor freight firm, and I took a customer to lunch at 1130, and while we were eating lunch, I casually asked him if he'd care to go see the Kennedy motorcade. As it turned out, Ernest Brandt's customer did want to go. And I suggested that we go to Dealey Plaza. Within a few minutes, the Kennedy motorcade rolled down Houston Street. Just as he got a little past us, bang. There was a loud report. My first thought was it was a motorcycle backfire. My second thought immediately was that Kennedy heard that motorcycle backfire, and he was just playfully reacting to it, see? Boy, and then in about three seconds or so, there was a second loud report like that, and then I realized it was not a motorcycle backfire. And somebody was shooting from somewhere, and I got scared, and I looked for a tree. Soon the awful truth became clear. The Associated Press reports from Dallas that President Kennedy was a shot today. Brandt and his customer had to make a decision. We discussed it for a couple of minutes, and I told him, I said, John, we better tell the police we're here. Well, he looked at his watch, and he said, no, I think I, you better take me back to work. He says, my boss is a, a, believes in punctuality. So we walked right in front of the Texas School Book Depository with all the policemen with their shotguns and rifles in hand, and... We told no one. Ernest Brandt was 37 then. He's turned the events over in his mind a million times. I have not only was an eyewitness, but I have researched this thing off and on. Although a lot of people say, no, he, one man couldn't do such a horrible thing all alone. But one man did, in my opinion. Still, when Brandt looks back 40 years... To this day, I regret not telling the police or the authorities we were there. For JFK 40, I'm Jim Ryan, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories, on News Talk 820, WBAP. North Texans born before the mid-90s remember Jerry Haynes as Channel 8's kids show host, Mr. Peppermint. He had only been doing the show for a year when he and his boss decided to go for a walk on November 22, 1963. It was a beautiful day. We had gone down from the station, which is about three blocks from Dealey Plaza. I wanted to see him and Jackie, you know. So we just were there to have a good time. 
We were on the northwest corner of Houston, and uh, I guess it was Maine coming down. Yeah, we saw them coming. They turned. We waved. We watched them turn the corner then into the uh, infamous stretch. We were turning around leaving when I would stake my life that there were three shots. But we knew something terrible had happened, so uh, Jay said, you run back to the station and get them ready, and I'll get some witnesses. And I ran like the Dickens, and I heard a woman saying, oh, my Lord, they've killed him. We'll never forget that. Did the president's assassination ever play into Mr. Peppermint? Uh, not really. I don't try to overstep and become any kind of an authority. I just like to go down the middle. So I didn't attempt to uh, teach any lessons or anything like that. Did your life change as a result of that day in any way, do you think? Well, sure. There was a certain, you know, another layer is there and, and for your memory and things like that. And uh, But uh, to say that I was affected a great deal, no, I don't think so. For JFK 40, I'm Dan Potter, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK, 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. Farther up the street from the 6th Floor Museum stands another piece of JFK history at the old police headquarters building. Yeah, there is Lee Oswald. It was there Lee Harvey Oswald was incarcerated for a short time and ultimately met his end. The question since for Dallas officials has been what to do with the building. The events of 1963 remarkably changed Dallas, and it's extremely important to preserve that history. That's Councilwoman Valletta Lill who has been working on development options. The complex that housed Oswald is split into two different sections. One is the old city hall, the other is a 1950s edition right here next to me which includes the jail cell Oswald was housed in as well as the Sally Port entrance where Jack Ruby pulled his gun. It's this newer building that was initially proposed for demolition to make way for a downtown plaza. There is a recommendation to remove it, but nonetheless, there would be consideration for saving anything that related to the events of 1963. I think, though, there is another segment of the community that would be concerned about the removal of even the 1950s portion. For now, the project is in limbo while other issues are pushed to the forefront. Councilwoman Lill would like to see Oswald-related areas turned into a museum, perhaps with the help of six floor officials. But the difficulty relates to the heating and air conditioning systems, the sort of mundane infrastructure of the building. The 50s building's in pretty sad shape. For JFK 40, I'm Lance Ligas, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820 WBAP. After almost 40 years, former WBAP TV filmographer and radio reporter Bob Welsh still knows the words and the rhythm. It's not known for sure, but it's believed President, President Kennedy, Kennedy has been shot. President Kennedy was in a motorcade and... Ro- Welsh, then in his mid-twenties, was not at Dealey Plaza where the shots were fired. He was at the Dallas Trademark on Stemmons Freeway where President Kennedy was to arrive in a few minutes for a luncheon speech. Welsh was standing near about a dozen police motorcycles when he heard their radios. The police chatter was broken by one particular call that I happened to pick up on, which was there's been a shooting in the motorcade. And it was followed very quickly by it happened near the underpass. 
That's the only information I had. And about the time I was hearing that, here comes the motorcade. Actually, it was just one car with a squadron of motorcycles around it. And I jumped in the news car and took up after the motorcade. So I was literally driving behind the president's motorcade at the same time trying to alert the newsroom what had happened. Unfortunately, the newsroom was empty, but... A photographer friend, Floyd Bright, just happened to be walking through the newsroom, heard me pleading on the radio for somebody, please intercept this message. And he did. And he says, Bob, I'll roll tape. And he did. And I proceeded to give the message while driving behind the motorcade. When Floyd reminds me very quickly that he'd made a mistake or pushed the wrong button, or the tape didn't roll, but I had to do it again. So the tape you actually hear, and that was the first word out of Dallas, Texas, is the second time. Welsh also scored another coup at Parkland Hospital, getting the only sound motion picture footage, for that matter, the only sound recording of the announcement of the president's death. John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. For JFK 40, Steve Cumming, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. Wes Wise was a reporter for KRLD Television on November 22, 1963. At approximately 12.30, he was at the Trademark, where he had been working with the Secret Service on identifying possible troublemakers, an outgrowth of an ugly incident involving Ambassador Adlai Stevenson a month earlier. I noticed one of the Secret Service guys that I had been working with walking swiftly uh, down the aisle, and then another one, and on the second one, I stopped him and said, hey, what's going on? And he says, the worst has happened. Like all media members, that day was long and grueling for Wes Wise, and that was probably a good thing. You get into a story so uh, completely feet first that you, um, that you lose some of the uh, drama because you're so intent to get the camera setting right, to get the tape recorder going right, to get the right picture, to be the right place at the right time. But really, that was an advantage. And then when we stopped, I don't think there were any of us who would not admit we had some tears. The next morning, he was assigned to go back to the school book depository for a day after story. While there, he ran into Jack Ruby. And in the course of the conversation, he was pointing out that Jackie might have to come back to Dallas to testify in a trial of Lee Harvey Oswald and how awful that would be for her and so forth. And I made the remark that I had taken pictures uh, the day before at the trademark of the two western saddles that were going to be given by the city of Dallas to Caroline and John John. And when I said that, uh, tears came to his eyes, visibly. Wes Wise would go on to be mayor of Dallas, where on the 10th anniversary of the assassination, he was the one having to reflect on how the killing of President Kennedy had changed Dallas, Texas. He had a pretty good idea. For JFK 40, I'm Alan Stone, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. What we're trying to do in this country and what we're trying to do around the world, I believe is quite simple, and that is to build a military structure which will defend the vital interests of the United States. Word came up that the uh, president was dead, and you could have heard a pin drop, I suppose, because it was quiet. The Associated Press reports from Dallas that President Kennedy was a shot today just as his motorcade left the downtown section. Luke Mooney, Dallas County Sheriff's Deputy in 1963, stood on Main Street south of the Records Building and watched JFK's motorcade make that right turn onto Houston Street and disappear. Seconds later, he heard three gunshots and ran to the school book depository building. It was Mooney who found the so-called sniper's nest used by reputed assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. But found the three spent shell, which was evidence of the three shots that were fired. And it looked like he'd eat his lunch there or something. 
Shortly after Mooney found the spent shells, another sheriff's deputy found the murder weapon. He was standing there and they was looking at the rifle. We didn't know what it was, Italian rifles. It looked like the old 30 caliber carbine that we used in World War II. Since Mooney was the first policeman on the sixth floor of the book depository building, he discovered the perch from which Oswald is said to have fired the three shots. He says, contrary to popular belief, it was not the corner window on the sixth floor. It was one to the right. They said, Perry, that the cartons are up against the window sill. I said, they wasn't up against the window sill. I said, how... Could have been up against the windowsill, tilted. I couldn't have put my body out that window and look down if there had been any cartons of books up against it. Former Dallas County Sheriff's Deputy Luke Mooney. For JFK 40, I'm John Pendolino, WBAP, 24-hour news. Listen for JFK 40, the Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. It's not known for sure, but it is believed that President Kennedy has been shot. In the voices and the photographs of the Kennedy assassination, the one constant is confusion. I heard a firecracker go off. James Tague was driving into downtown Dallas when he got caught in traffic, snarled by the motorcade. You know, I wonder what kind of fools throwing firecrackers with the president driving by. Tegg had stopped halfway through the triple underpass and got out of his car just before he heard the shots. Then... We walked up, one of the men was uh, was shouting, or uh, very excited. He says, his head exploded. His head exploded, and the policeman asked, says, whose? He says, the president's. Tegg was approached by a man he later learned was a plainclothes sheriff's deputy. And he turned to me and he says, hey, you got blood on your face. And I reached up, touched my face, there's two or three drops of blood. But he says, hey, look at that mark on the curb. And you can see a whitish gray mark on this old dirty curb from probably 60 feet away. The assumption is that the cut on Tague's cheek was caused by a chunk of bullet-splintered concrete. He's considered by many Oswald's third victim behind the president and Governor Connolly. I do remember that when I left the police station, it was, I had a cold chill that turned colder and uh, went home, and that evening I did take a spiral notebook and write down everything I could remember and watch TV like everybody else. But that's basically what happened to me on, on November 22nd. Now James Tague intends to use those notes as the basis for a book as yet untitled. People have been after me for the last 15, 20 years to do this, and I've just now had time to do it. My book's going to be why we will never know the truth. For JFK 40, I'm Jim Ryan, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. November 63, I was at Channel 4, and I was the uh, anchor for the new news. On November 22, 1963, Bill Mercer had just finished up that new newscast. He left the Channel 4 studios in downtown Dallas knowing that the presidential motorcade had just passed through. He had no idea of the events that had transpired while he was on the air. Everybody was in just absolute turmoil. The people, women crying, men just out of their minds. And uh, we found out that uh, there had been the shooting. Just as the president's car became directly even with us, two shots rang out just as he looked up. And he grabbed we put a camera up on the uh, floor of the police station. They sent me over there, and I spent uh, whatever hours it was from 6 until the infamous uh, Oswald press conference after he'd been arrested in the basement. The purpose of this news conference is to detail some of the evidence against Oswald for the assassination of the president. What was, uh, what was your take on Oswald? Were you, you were there for the news conference? Yeah, I was sitting about as close as uh, I am to you, about three feet away. I didn't shoot anybody. Uh, he wasn't yelling and screaming. I haven't been told what I'm here for. Somebody asked him a question and he would say, 
I don't know, or that you know, just yell it back. You have a lawyer? No, so I don't. It wasn't a, an aggressive sort of tone. He just looked like a guy, you know, just any guy that came off the street. Does that mean anything to you to have been that close to history? Somehow I had just no real feeling at the time. We were just curious to, to find stuff and see stuff. Going back and looking at tapes and realizing what we were doing, we did a pretty good job of covering it. For JFK 40, I'm Rick Hadley, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories, on News Talk 820, WBAP. 40 years ago, Alex Burton was working as a film cutter and script writer for the Texas News. That's the newsreel that aired weeknights at 10 on what was then WBAP-TV. Kennedy's arrival in town was big news, but Burton says not everyone was ready to welcome him. There was a lot of anti-Kennedy feeling because of his insistence on the, um, the equality of the races, let's put it that way. Kennedy arrived first in Fort Worth, surrounded by a cadre of Secret Service agents. And I remember a, a cop in Fort Worth. He was joking about the Secret Service, and he said, why would anybody be worried about the president being in Texas. He says, nobody's going to harm him here. You'd think we want Lyndon Johnson as president. By the time the president had made his way to Dallas, Burton wasn't in the newsroom yet, so he had no idea what happened as the motorcade passed the school book depository building. I got a telephone call from a guy in Canada that I had worked with, and he said, can you give me some tape on what's going on? And I said, well, what's going on? And he said, they just shot the president. And I went, ooh, well, let me think about that. I better get to work. The next several hours were chaos, with reporters from both WBAP and NBC chasing down every conceivable angle. I have absolutely no memory of how it went on. Uh, it was just busy as hell. That's all I remember. And the network took over all of the airtime, so there was no Texas news that night. Eventually, Channel 5 staffers were told to go home. Burton says no one did. For JFK 40, I'm Lance Liggis, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories, on News Talk 820, WBAP. You've seen the famous photo in which Lee Harvey Oswald is shot as Jack Ruby lunges toward him. You probably also remember the horrified Dallas homicide detective in a light-colored suit and western hat on Oswald's right. That was Jim Lavelle, who had less than an hour earlier recommended to Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry that Oswald be taken from the police station at Maine and Harwood to the Dallas County Jail in secret. I said, you know, Chief, that the elevator stops on this first floor. Why don't we take him off here, put him in a car on Main Street? I said, we can be in the county jail with him before they even know we brought him out of the jail. And his words to me were, Lavelle, I have told them that they can film the transfer and I'm going to keep my word. I don't want people to think that we abused him or mistreated him or beat him up or anything while he was in our custody here. Now Lavelle's left hand was handcuffed to Oswald's right as both men and Detective Elsie Graves on Oswald's left walked into the police station basement and the glaring lights of the press corps. Yeah, there is Lee. Uh, before I got all the way out, I could see underneath the lights and I saw Jack Ruby standing in the middle of the driveway and he had the pistol at his side. I immediately tried to pull Oswald behind me. He's been shot. He's been shot. 
and when I pulled on Oswald, instead of being able to pull him behind him, and all I succeeded in doing was just turning his body, so instead of the bullet hitting him dead center, he hit about four inches to the left of his navel. Probably the, the only thing that saved me from getting hit, because if it hadn't slowed the bullet down, it went on through him and hit me in roughly the same place. That was Lavelle's closest encounter with Oswald. Two days earlier, he had been sent to Oak Cliff to check into the shooting of police officer J.D. Tippett, not knowing that the suspect in that shooting would also be the suspect in the killing of President Kennedy. When Lavelle arrived at the scene, Oswald had fled to the nearby Texas theater where he was about to be arrested. For JFK 40, Steve Cumming, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, the lost Kennedy tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. If you believe the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald by Jack Ruby was part of a conspiracy, that view is not supported by the timeline of events surrounding the shooting. It does support the proposition that Ruby acted on impulse within a very small window of opportunity. It was incredibly small, and that's one reason I've never subscribed to the conspiracy theory. Former Channel 4 anchor Walter Evans was news director at WFAA Radio at the time of the Oswald shooting. On the morning of Sunday, November 24, 1963, Ruby got a call from one of his strippers asking for an advance of $25. The place from where he sent a money gram was not far from where Oswald was being held. He was up the street a block away sending a telegram. After he finished that, he walked down the street. Dallas Police Detective Jim Lavelle, who was the man in the light-colored suit and western hat on Oswald's right in the famous photo of the shooting, did some checking afterward. Money gram was stamped at 11.17, four minutes prior to the time that Oswald was shot in the basement. Lavelle discovered it took a little over three minutes to walk to the jail from the Western Union office. Ruby liked to hang around the police station, so when he got to the jail's basement exit, he noticed activity and that only one guard had been posted for security. Lavelle says Ruby told him the following. That officer standing guard at that entrance ramp turned his back. He said, I just darted in behind the car and we're all run down the ramp mixed with the news media. Where seconds later, Oswald was brought from an elevator toward a police vehicle and Jack Ruby's waiting handgun. <laughs> He couldn't have been in that basement more than a half a minute to a minute at the very most. Oswald's transfer had been running over an hour late. When it came time to leave, Lavelle says it took a while for the elevator to arrive, and that came after Oswald asked for a sweater, which took time to find. Had any of those factors not come into play, Ruby would have arrived too late, and Oswald would have lived to face trial for the murder of President Kennedy. For JFK 40, Steve Cumming, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, the lost Kennedy tapes. Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. Dallas policeman James Jennings was guarding the back entrance of Parkland Hospital when he got the news that President Kennedy was dead. They gave us about a five-minute warning before they went uh, national with the fact that he was had deceased. And uh, we were told that within two minutes, Lyndon Johnson and his party would be coming out of the emergency room. So they wanted us to get them away from there as quickly and as quietly as we possibly could. As the new president left to return to Love Field, the body of the dead president would soon follow. When they started to bring the uh, body out of the emergency room, uh, one of the commanders came over and said, we need some help loading the casket. Four or five of us went over and helped physically put the casket in the back of the hearse. Hovering nearby, the former First Lady, Jacqueline Kennedy. I was standing just right beside her, shoulder to shoulder, and I said, come up here, uh, I'll open this door and let you set up here or let you in. And, of course, she said, no, I don't want to ride up there. I want to ride in the back. So I closed the front door of the hearse, opened the back door, and she got in where the casket was. We all remember the blood-stained pink suit and the pillbox hat. Officer Jennings remembers something else. Jackie Kennedy's face appeared as if she had been hit at close range with a handful of gravel because she had little pit marks over her face, maybe eight or ten, and you could see red under the skin. 
and uh, that was very visible and uh, just very something I remember even to now. And I'm saying that it was, and I'm almost positive it was bone fragments. For JFK 40, I'm Alan Stone, WBAP 24 Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years. 40 people. 40 stories. On News Talk 820 WBAP. The president was reported taken to Parkland Hospital near the Dallas Trade Mart where he was to have made a speech. From the time we entered the room until we knew that he was dead was no more than 10 minutes. Dr. Roland Jones. In 1963, he was the chief resident of surgery at Parkland Hospital. On November 22nd, he was eating lunch in the cafeteria when Jones, along with other top physicians at Parkland, began to be frantically paged. I got up from the table and went to the other side of the cafeteria, picked up the phone and called the operator and asked her why she was paging everyone's staff. She said, Dr. Jones, the president's been shot and they're bringing him to the emergency room and they need some physicians right away. Jones remembers a jam-packed operating room when JFK's body was brought in. He did not look exactly right. The skin of his face looked relaxed. This was probably the result of extensive skull fractures. Feverishly, Dr. Jones and the other physicians try to get a pulse. A heartbeat. We did not have time to look at the extent of the head injury. He's flat on the cart. Most of this head injury is at the back of the head. Two priests who were with President Kennedy say he has died of bullet wounds. Jones suspects President Kennedy was dead when he arrived at Parkland. During their procedure, he and the other physicians forgot about the fact they were working on the president. That illusion disappeared when Jones walked from the operating room into a hallway. A gentleman came up to me and identified himself and said, I'm with the Secret Service, and I need to call Joseph Kennedy and tell him the condition of his son. Coincidentally, two days later, Dr. Jones would attempt to save the life of Lee Harvey Oswald. For JFK 40, John Pendolino, WBAP, 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years. 40 people. 40 stories. On News Talk 820 WBAP. Bob Gerberding was a street agent in the Dallas FBI office on Friday, November 22nd, 1963. Before the weekend was over, his job responsibilities had changed significantly. I was told uh, that Sunday morning that he wanted me to coordinate the Oswald and assassination aspects. He was Jay Gordon Shanklin, head of the Federal Bureau's Dallas office. Bob Gerberding looked at all evidence accumulated by the FBI for the Warren report. He says the case against Lee Harvey Oswald was conclusive. We traced a rifle, I think, as early as Friday night that a guy by the name of A. Heidel had ordered this rifle and the order form and the money order of $21.45 that paid for it were all in Oswald's handwriting. Plus, it was shipped to a post office box that had been rented by Oswald. There was a handprint and a palm print found on the underside of the rifle barrel, which were Oswald's. There were three dispensed cartridges by the windows from which the shots were fired. And those three shells casings were established to have been fired from Oswald's rifle to the exclusion of all others. In other words, Mr. Gerberding is not who you want to go to to discuss conspiracy theories, but his conclusions about Oswald's motives are vague. I thought, and I still think to this day, that his primary motive was recognition. He wanted to do something. Even Marina said this, that he was a nobody who wanted to be somebody. If you think someone other than Oswald shot John Kennedy, no need to talk to FBI agent Bob Gerberding. Well, we didn't find many things that showed he didn't do it, except a lot of these conspiracy theories, which... We could usually blow holes in. For JFK 40, I'm Alan Stone, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, 
The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820 WBAP. JFK, 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820 WBAP. I'm at Farmer's Branch on my way to see a man named Phil Chamberlain, November 22nd, 1963. Phil Chamberlain was the production supervisor at the Kodak Labs in Dallas. It's the day that Abraham Zapruder brought him a film that would become an American history icon. I was very active in ham radio at the time. Just as I was pulling into our parking lot at Kodak, a fellow came on and he said, I'm over at Parkland Hospital, all hell's broken loose over here. Kennedy and Connolly have just been shot. And I said, yeah, ha ha, sick joke. <laughs> so when did Abraham Zapruder enter your life? Our receptionist called and said, uh, Mr. Chamberlain, I have a man here who thinks he might have pictures of the assassination. He was there by himself with his camera. A lot of people insist that he came with somebody else, but he did not, and I can verify that because I was the only one there beside the receptionist. He said that he, he was taking pictures and he thought he might have pictures of the assassination. We normally inspect 8 millimeter film by projecting it in a projector that runs twice normal speed. But even at that, when the pictures came through, you could just hear the intake of amazement and so on in the, in the group. There were probably 15 of us in there. Did you realize that there was a good image of, of Kennedy being hit? Certainly did, yes, e even at that speed. We were aware of it. In fact, we could see at that point the one frame that they didn't show for quite a while where literally looked like his head was exploding from the shot. What did Mr. Zapruder say at that point? I really can't remember. Can't remember what he said. For JFK 40, Dan Potter, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK, 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. Some say this tape contains evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald was not working alone, that certain acoustics indicate the presence of another shooter. Lord, no. Never has been. Ain't now. Ain't ever going to be. Dallas County Sheriff Jim Bowles worked for the Dallas Police Department 40 years ago and was called upon to transcribe tapes for the Warren Commission. The tapes contained sounds from a police motorcycle radio left open. First off, they said there were sound impulses. Well, then why weren't there shots because we've had shots fired over police radios in the past. In fact, in August 1978, when the House Select Committee came to Dallas and recreated the shooting scenario in Dealey Plaza with microphones set up all over everywhere, we had the shot sound. The recording was made on a dictograph belt which used a needle to scratch sounds onto a plastic band. Sheriff Bull says he tracked down the inventor of that machine. I told him the uh, Select Committee had suggested that it had recorded supersonic bullet impulses and echoes. He said, well, don't argue with them. Let them make that claim. We'd like to have that distinction. It's not true, but we'd sure like to have that recognition. In fact, Bowles says the recording in question was made by a motorcycle nowhere near the Kennedy Parade, but at the trademark, four miles away. There is no acoustical evidence from Dealey Plaza except in the minds and imaginations of conspiracy buffs who must put it there because that's the only way they can create a second shooter and disprove Oswald as being part of a conspiracy because nobody in their right mind would hire a Lee Harvey Oswald for the, the hit of all history. For JFK 40, I'm Lance Ligas, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 
40 Stories on News Talk 820 WBAP. He bills himself as the man who captured Oswald, and Nick McDonald is a Dallas police officer who was sent to Oak Cliff after reports of another officer shot, J.D. Tippett. He was a locker mate next to me. I knew what district he worked. I even knew his squad number because the, the guy that reported the officer being down and shot said he was talking on the radio from police unit number 10, and I knew immediately that was J.D. Tippett's vehicle. Moments later, on November 22, 1963, Officer McDonald walked up the aisle of the Texas Theater toward Lee Harvey Oswald and into history. I said, get on your feet. He stood up. So I said, man, this is easy. He's, he's giving up without a fight. But it changed in just a second because he made a fist with his left hand and hit me right between the eyes. And then I was reaching for a waist for a weapon, and he pulled that pistol out, and my hand happened to fall on top of it. He pulled the trigger, and the firing pin hit me in the fleshy part of my left hand between the thumb and the forefinger, and it was pointed right at me. And so I think that's what saved my life at that point. I hit him, knocked him in the seat, and fell on top of him, and I was wrestling for that pistol because I knew he couldn't hurt me with those fists, but uh, that pistol could kill me. So I finally got my right hand on the butt of the pistol, and I jerked it away, and just for an instant, I stuck it in the stomach. I said, well, I'm going to shoot him because he tried to shoot me, and then I had a second thought. And I said, no, I don't have to shoot him because I've got his weapon. If I had, you know, went directly to him, you know, instead of playing it cool, well, uh, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. For JFK 40, I'm Alan Stone, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. Jay Skaggs, an amateur photographer, had taken his family to downtown Dallas to see the president. They were positioned on the corner of Main and Houston streets. In less than a minute, the motorcade would pass in front of the Texas School Book Depository. I was right on the edge of the street as the car turned, was ready to take a picture, and, and the president was looking the other way. And I yelled and uh, yelled and hoping he would turn my way. And uh, he didn't. I finally decided if I'm going to get a shot, I'm going to have to take it. So I went ahead and took a picture. Officials at the Sixth Floor Museum feel Skaggs took the last still picture of John Kennedy prior to the first shot being fired. And I mumbled something to my wife about some jerk, you know, shooting a firecracker. Then I heard the other two shots, and I knew it was a rifle. And I ran across the street. I did get a picture of one or two of the press cars and the bus, I think, loaded with, with officials. Within just a minute or two after the assassination, Jay Skaggs was on the railroad tracks in front of where the shots were fired. Well, there wasn't anyone up there. I ran into a motorcycle policeman. We both looked all around the what they call the grassy knoll. It's been 40 years, but the images of the dashing young president and the glamorous first lady remain etched in Mr. Skaggs' mind. She was always a beautiful lady, and he was a handsome man. She was well-dressed, as you would expect, beautiful, smiling, and he was the same way. And that's what Jay Skaggs saw less than 60 seconds before the Kennedy presidency ended. For JFK 40, I'm Alan Stone, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories, on News Talk 820, WBAP. In his words, it was the biggest story in his career. 
Retired Associated Press reporter Mike Cochran spent November 22, 1963 and the following days on various assignments, including covering the funeral of accused assassin Lee Harvey Oswald at Cowtown's Rose Hill Cemetery. They had nobody to carry the casket, so they recruited uh, news guys. They asked me to do it because I was with the Associated Press, and I said, no, I didn't want to carry this casket. And then a UPI reporter, uh, Preston McGraw, said, well, I will. As soon as UPI did, well, then I had to. <laughs> but that's how I became a pallbearer. That pallbearer experience paid dividends a few years later when the AP assigned Cochran to interview Oswald's widow, Marina, at her home in Richardson. Showing up unannounced, Cochran's interview request was turned down by the now remarried Marina Porter, whose husband Kenneth was at work. Cochran mentioned that he had served as a pallbearer for her late husband, and that got him in the door for a cup of coffee. Six hours later, we were still talking. She got up at one point and flopped this playboy down in front of me and says, there's a story there that Marina had been the one ultimately responsible for the assassination because it was her sexual rejection of Oswald. I looked up and Marina says, I think he's right. Here I am, what an interview, and we're off the record. Just making small talk. I noticed on the fireplace these unusual andirons. And I said, those are the most unusual fireplace decorations. And she says, oh, those are the ugliest things. And she stopped in mid-sentence, and she says, Kenneth gave me those. That's the one thing you can't report. And, of course, that put everything on the record. I was out the door as quickly as I could, and around the corner in my Volkswagen, and uh, stopped, and I guess for 45 minutes, I just wrote notes. For JFK 40, I'm Rick Hadley, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd. On News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK, 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. In 1963, Hugh Ainsworth was a reporter for the Dallas Morning News. He says a very small, very vocal minority literally hated John Kennedy. For one thing, he was Catholic, and a lot of people worried about a Catholic president. It was disliked because people in Texas particularly thought that Lyndon Johnson was treated rather shabbily. When Kennedy received a very warm welcome in Dallas, Ainsworth was delighted. Of course, that did not last long. President Kennedy has been shot. After the shooting, Ainsworth Ainsworth was standing near a police radio when he heard a cop had been shot in Oak Cliff. I got to thinking that's only three or four miles from where we are. That's bound to be connected to this in some way. Ainsworth wound up inside the Texas theater, the only reporter to witness the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald. I remember Oswald saying, I protest this police brutality. I protest this police brutality. Well, they are shooting about pretty fast. There must have been three to four hundred people out there chanting, kill him, kill him, get him. November 22nd, 1963, in the days that followed, Followed were long ones for Ainsworth. I heard so many people say, somebody ought to kill that SOB, you know, that communist SOB. Nobody would ever indict him. He'd be a hero. I'm sure Jack Ruby heard that, too. In the 40 years since JFK's death, Ainsworth has dedicated his life to disproving conspiracy theories. When you look at Oswald and the evidence against him, I've covered probably 100 murder cases in 54 years of reporting. Probably more evidence in this case than 99% of the murder cases I've covered. But you Hugh Ainsworth concedes some people find it hard to accept that, in his words, a weak, ineffective malcontent could kill the most powerful man on earth. For JFK 40, John Pendolino, WBAP, 24-hour news. Listen for JFK 40, the lost Kennedy tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. President Kennedy was shot on Friday, November 22, 1963, at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. His time of death was officially logged as 1 p.m. The formal announcement came at 1.30. But former Channel 4 News Director and anchor Eddie Barker, who was broadcasting live from the Dallas Trademark, where Kennedy was to have spoken to a large luncheon group, knew the outcome well before the announcement and before the official time of death. I uh, was on the air, and a doctor that I knew from uh, Parkland came up to me and whispered in my ear. He said, Eddie, he's dead. So I kind of looked at him. I said, what do you mean? And he said, I just called an emergency room, and he was DOA. And so I went 
gone on the air and said that I had been told from what I considered the most reliable source that I could have, a doctor who had just talked to the emergency room and the president was dead. Kennedy had been there only a few minutes, making Barker the first broadcaster to air the news of the president's death. It was way before 1 o'clock when I uh, made the announcement. It was carried on CBS, and they really were kind of upset that, you know, who is this guy? <laughs> he's our guy down there, but he's saying he's dead. Do we have a confirmation to that? That confirmation later came from Dan Rather. Barker also got the first interview with Lee Harvey Oswald's wife, Marina. It was after the Warren Commission had been named and before she went up to the Warren Commission. It was in that interview where she said, I believe Lee killed the president. Of course, as the years went by and money started playing into the uh, act a little bit, well, she began to have doubts about his involvement. Marina met and married Oswald during his short stay in Russia a couple of years before the assassination. One of Barker's questions got a pointed answer. Marina, what in the world did you see in Lee Harvey Oswald? And both she looked at me and she said, a way out of Russia. For JFK 40, I'm Steve Cumming, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40. The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK, 40. 40 years, 40 people. 40 stories on News Talk 820 WBAP. Dallas Morning News nightclub editor Tony Zoppi was supposed to have watched the presidential parade with Jack Ruby. But when Ruby opted out to place newspaper ads for his strip clubs, Zoppi went to lunch. The manager of the restaurant told him what he had missed. His lips were purple and they were trembling. And he looked at me and he said, the president's been shot. Later at Parkland Hospital, Tony Zoppi saw the inside of the presidential limousine. The blood all over the seat. Took your stomach, you know, and churned it. He helped O'Neill Funeral Home unload a big bronze casket and carry it into the hospital. Zoppi knew what that meant and phoned in the information to the newspaper. Two days later, a man he had known and reported on for years became an integral part of history. You expected it, but you didn't expect it. Uh, he, he was a paradox. Let's say it didn't surprise me, but it surprised me. Like many others, Tony Zoppi knew but never understood Jack Ruby. He was the only reporter Ruby was allowed to call from his jail cell. But even that exclusivity didn't get Tony Zoppi the answers he was looking for. The last tape I made, I asked him point blank. I said, Jack, why the hell did you do it? And he started to cry. He said those poor kids left without a father, you know, and went through that litany again. Ruby also told him that he wanted to spare Jackie Kennedy the ordeal of coming back to Dallas for a trial. The final reason he gave in that last interview may give more insight into Ruby's character. He said, quote, I wanted to show people there was one Jew with some guts. Tony Zoppi went on to become PR director for the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas, where he developed lifelong friendships with Frank Sinatra and Bob Hope. For JFK 40, I'm Alan Stone, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. 40 years and 24 miles south of Dallas, Rio Sam Pierce contemplates his role in Kennedy history. Though not directly connected, he plays a bit part. You know, I realize that part of history. Either the right place at the right time or the right, wrong place at the wrong time. I don't know which way you want to put it. Pierce was a Dallas police lieutenant back then and was in the basement at police headquarters the day Lee Harvey Oswald was being transferred to the county jail, two days after Kennedy was shot. They didn't do that uh, according to normal procedure. The county usually did the transfer of prisoners that had been filed on. I suppose that the powers that be wanted to make sure there wasn't any criticism of the way Oswald been treated or whatever, you know. Pierce's job was to get a car to drive in front of the armored van that Oswald was supposed to be in. I came down, got a car, 
had to go out the opposite way to get around the city hall to get in front of this armored car that was already down in the basement. And by the time I made that trip, they had already brought him down. He'd already been shot. There's the man with a gun. All that in the space of a few seconds. Pierce doesn't recall seeing Jack Ruby walking down the ramp into the basement area, and he doesn't believe they knew each other. But Pierce says both shared a sense of self-importance. I think Ruby really felt like if he could do that with no punity at all public would be so behind him so strong that he had never serve a day in prison. I think he could just see his name in light down there on that old carousel club that he had. For JFK 40, I'm Lance Ligas, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. While John Kennedy was being laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery on Monday, November 25th, 1963, his assassin was being buried in relative anonymity at Rose Hill Cemetery in Fort Worth at the same time. Not many people wanted to be there, including police and Secret Service officials who had to be there. And, of course, there were reporters like Ed Hughes of the Dallas Morning News. No one else was allowed inside the cemetery. There were no protesters. When they brought Oswald's casket, some of us helped the uh, funeral attendants uh, move it into a chapel where they kept it under um, uh, security until it was time to, to take it down to the graveside. A lack of pallbearers meant more volunteers to take the casket to the graveside and continued to force reporters sent to cover the story to be a part of it. A reporter that suddenly said, you know, this is making history. And then we had a whole bunch of other people that suddenly wanted to help us carry it down. I ended up uh, taking a few steps with it. It was a very, very heavy casket. We were wondering at one time whether it was just a sack full of potatoes, but the... Uh, Chief of the police for Fort Worth convinced us that no, Oswald's body was in there. Twenty years later, Marina Oswald would be persuaded by a British researcher to have Lee Oswald's body exhumed under the theory the man buried in the casket was someone else. Reporter Ed Hughes says that decision was shocking considering what he saw happen at the end of the burial service. They did open up the casket. Marina uh, Oswald, the wife, and uh, Marguerite Oswald, mother of Lee Harvey, lean over into the casket, um, and uh, then they closed it up, and we were motioned to be closer in where they gave the last rites. For JFK 40, I'm Alan Stone, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes. Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. This is a snapshot, one man's story of November 22, 1963, one chance encounter, as then WFAA radio program director Pierce Allman witnessed the shooting of JFK and then ran toward the school book depository. Up the steps to the depository building, asked a guy where a phone was, and he jerked his thumb and said, in there, and I went in, got the only phone there in the lobby, and dialed the station, and some weeks later, the Secret Service called and asked if they could come in and visit, and I said, sure. They asked me to describe precisely where I was standing and exactly my actions after the shots, what I had done, and they were especially interested in the confrontation at the door of the depository building when I asked the man where the phone was. And we went through it several times. And finally they said, are you familiar with the testimony of Lee Harvey Oswald following his arrest? And I said, no. They said, well, he states that as he was leaving the depository building, a young man with a crew cut rushed up, identified himself as a newsman, and asked where the phone was. And he said, based on what he said and your gestures and responses, we are convinced that that was you. It's been confirmed that, that I did encounter Oswald on the way out, not only witnessing the assassination of the president, but then speaking to the assassin leaving the scene is a disturbing memory sometimes because you get into a series of what-ifs. You can't help a little bit of... You know, what if, what if you had known or whatever. 
at, at no time during the entire ev series of events did the enormity of the occurrence ever sink in. For JFK 40, Dan Potter, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories, on News Talk 820, WBAP. For many of the journalists covering President Kennedy's trip to Texas, the workday actually began on November 21st. In those days, the UPI uh, would send a bulletin on the arrival and departure of a president. So that's what I was there to do. Here in this rain in Fort Worth, in Texas, in the United States, we're going forward. Thank you. Preston McGraw was already a veteran UPI reporter in 1963. His main responsibility on the 22nd was to cover Kennedy's speech at the trademark. The White House press secretary had provided McGraw and the other reporters an advance copy. So I wrote an advance on the speech and sent it by telegraph and leisurely got in my car and drove to the trademark where Kennedy was supposed to speak. Suddenly the story McGraw had already filed to the Dallas UPI Bureau was tragically premature. There was a sudden flurry of activity. And they told me he had been shot. And McGraw rushed the few blocks to Parkland Hospital. The White House press secretary came out and said the president died at 1 p.m. Fast forward past the assassination, past the shooting of the shooter. McGraw was sent to cover the funeral of Lee Harvey Oswald in Fort Worth. It soon became clear that not enough mourners were present to serve as pallbearers. I stepped up and I took it and the AP man got on the other side and, and we took it to the grave. Preston McGraw's career with UPI would last another 20 years, but the final two weeks of November 1963 represent the story of a lifetime. I guess I'm not allowed to forget it, but <laughs> yeah, oh yes, undoubtedly it was the biggest, yeah, undoubtedly. For JFK 40, I'm Jim Ryan, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories, on News Talk 820, WBAP. Over the past four decades, there's been a movement by historians who have no doubt that John F. Kennedy's death was a conspiracy. One of these theorists has been researching what he says is the truth for the last 39 years. You can find him just about every weekend here at Dealey Plaza. His name is Robert Groden. Well, the idea initially of coming down to Dealey Plaza was to um, let people know that there is an alternative to the official fiction. Let people know that there actually it was a conspiracy to kill the president and another conspiracy to cover it up. Groden became a leading photographic and filmed evidence expert in the case, which has been formally closed since 1988. He says multiple gunmen were involved in Kennedy's assassination, perhaps as many as four to six, but Lee Harvey Oswald wasn't one of them. Oswald could not possibly have done it. He wasn't on the sixth floor where they're telling us the shots came from. So what was the motive? Depending on who was responsible for this, that's where the motive comes from. If it's organized crime, it's because the government was doing nothing to stop the mob until President Kennedy and his brother Bob if it was some element of the military-industrial complex, it's because they wanted to continue the Vietnam War. It was big business and big money to a lot of people. And the CIA? I would not say the CIA as an organization was involved in the killing of a president, but there were people there who hated him within the organization. He had, in fact, fired the entire hierarchy of the CIA. Groden says the key elements in the case are still unknown, and he relates it to the layers of an onion. The outside of the onion that we see, Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Get rid of that lie, and you go underneath it, and you've got Oswald did it, but with organized crime. As you get closer to the center, pretty soon you realize Oswald had nothing to do with this, and that elements of the government quite possibly did, and certainly organized crime did. And we are about halfway through those peels now. We still have the other half to go. For JFK 40, I'm Ellie Hogue, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP.
JFK, 40. 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. Dallas Times Herald reporter Darwin Payne didn't have a specific assignment on November 22, 1963, but he ended up with several, including being one of the first people to talk to Abraham Zapruder, who filmed the assassination and who was watching television when Payne arrived, arguing with broadcast reports that the president was still alive. Zapruder was saying, no, he's dead. I know he's dead. I saw it through my viewfinder. His head exploded like a firecracker. That night, Darwin Payne was sent to visit the room at the boarding house where Lee Oswald had lived. Well, it was a very tiny room. The uh, Secret Service and FBI had already cleared everything out of the room. There There was nothing there. Several weeks later, he visited the assassin's widow, Marina. Marina indicated she wanted to talk, but couldn't. She let me in the house so easily. And people were concerned about her safety that I called her lawyer afterwards and told him, I said, look, I just wanted you to know that Marina didn't know me, and yet she let me in the house immediately, and per- perhaps, you know, you could be a little more cautious about that, because I was, I was concerned about her safety. Darwin Payne went on to become a journalism professor at SMU for many years, as well as the author of several books on the history of the city of Dallas. He looks back over 40 years and sees the assassination as a turning point. The hate mail started pouring in on Dallas. And Dallas did have a reputation for being an extremist right-wing community. And at that point, the city decided to moderate itself. The leaders did, and, uh, and, and we changed uh, considerably after that and started trying to be more moderate in every way and, and to bring more people into the city government and to make their voices heard. For JFK 40, I'm Alan Stone, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, the lost Kennedy tapes, at 11 a.m. Saturday, November 22nd on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years. 40 people, 40 stories, on News Talk 820, WBAP. Before John F. Kennedy, Cowtown had been a presidential no-man's land for nearly three decades. We had not had a sitting president in Fort Worth, except on the campaign swing, since 1936. In 2003, Jim Wright, now 80 years old, has suffered oral cancer. In 1963, then-Congressman Wright was a rising national star in the Democratic Party. He helped to arrange President Kennedy's visit to the Metroplex on November 22nd, 1963. I'm glad to be here in uh, Jim Wright City. He's contributed to its growth. He speaks for Fort Worth. He speaks for the country. A few hours after Kennedy's appearance at that Fort Worth hotel, he was headed to downtown Dallas. Jim Wright recalls the president's decision to ride in an open car. He wanted to see the whites of their eyes. He wanted them to see his face and his eyes and who he was. Though his uh, Secret Service people were trying to prevail upon him to take that bubble top limousine, but uh, President Kennedy just refused that. Wright was a few cars behind the president's limousine. As I passed that crowd on the grassy knoll, I could tell by the looks on their faces that they had just witnessed a a stunning event. They were petrified. Congressman Jim Wright eventually rose through the ranks of his party to become Speaker of the House. In the midst of a controversy involving sales of a book he had written, Wright stepped down from office in 1989. Even now, Wright says his friendship with the president and that dark day in Dallas shaped his view of public service. It wasn't a question of making the government our enemy or something to hate. It was us. For JFK 40, I'm Jim Ryan, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, the lost Kennedy tapes, at 11 a.m. Saturday, November 22nd, on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories, on News Talk 820, WBAP. Ray Hawkins was an accident investigator for the Dallas police doing his job on that long ago Friday, 40 years ago, when in an instant everything changed. The motorcade came by going to Parkland Hospital with the red lights and siren on, and we checked with the dispatcher to see what had happened, and they said that the president had been shot. Later, Hawkins and a group of other officers were sent to Oak Cliff to investigate the shooting of policeman J.D. Tippett, 
Witnesses said they saw a suspect run into the Texas theater. We proceeded down the aisle. I heard Officer McDonald say, I got him. And I saw a man standing up, and they were involved in a struggle. I, of course, ran to assist Officer McDonald. The suspect did have a gun out and was trying to shoot Officer McDonald, but uh, the gun apparently didn't fire. It sounded as if it clicked one time, and then we did subdue the suspect, and I handcuffed him. Many people don't realize how close Oswald came to killing other people that day. Of course, you never know what could have happened, but I think being that there were three of us so close that it did keep it from escalating into an officer being shot or, or someone else being shot in the theater. The police officers at the Texas theater only knew Lee Harvey Oswald was a suspect in the killing of a fellow policeman. The crowd outside had made a much bigger connection. Uh, we took him out front and there was a, a crowd of people out. They said, just let us have him and we'll, we'll have justice. Ray Hawkins pushed Oswald into the back seat of a squad car and never saw him again. He was sitting at home Sunday morning watching television when Oswald's life ended. For JFK 40, I'm Alan Stone, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, the lost Kennedy tapes, at 11 a.m. Saturday, November 22nd on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. It's a little after 11 o'clock Sunday morning, November 24th, 1963. President John F. Kennedy has been dead nearly two days now. And Dallas auto theft detective Don Archer is in the basement of the police department, awaiting arrival of the accused presidential assassin Lee Harvey Oswald for transfer to the county jail. In front of me, I saw some quick movement, then a shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. Everybody started rushing in. It's absolute panic. I was in that melee, and I saw someone with a gun. There's the man with a gun. I had Ruby, and we drug him into the jail office away from the crown. And I said, who is it? You all know me. I'm Jack Ruby. About that time, officers dragged the dying Lee Harvey Oswald into the same office. He was real pallor, and uh, I just didn't feel like he was going to live. Ruby was taken upstairs to the Dallas Police Investigations Room, where he was held for more than three hours with Detective Don Archer at his side. He was very, very nervous. In fact, I was scared he might have a heart attack. And I asked him if he wanted a cigarette, and he said, yeah. Later, an FBI agent pulled Archer aside and informed him that Oswald had died. Information Archer then passed on to Jack Ruby. When I told him Oswald was dead, he went completely calm. He said, I suppose Captain Fritz will be coming up for me now. And I said, yeah, but uh, I wish you'd uh, tell me everything as to why you did this. And he said, I just cannot stand Miss Kennedy having to come back here and testify in some trial against this lousy guy. I think he was telling the truth. I think he was. For JFK 40, Rick Hadley, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, the lost Kennedy tapes, at 11 a.m. Saturday, November 22nd on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories on News Talk 820, WBAP. Bobby Hargis was one of four Dallas motorcycle police officers selected to ride next to the JFK limousine on the parade route that day. As the motorcade turned onto Elm Street, directly in front of the school book depository, the first shot rang out. Yeah, I looked toward the president, and I thought maybe John Conley was hit because he turned around to look at the president, and he had a real surprised look on his face. Hargis was on the left rear of the limousine nearest Mrs. Kennedy. He heard a second, but not a third shot. Kennedy was bending over like he was listening to what uh, Conley had to say, but when he raised back up, that uh, second shot hit him in the head, and that's what killed him. And there was only two shots fired. Hargis instinctively turned his motorcycle to the right and ended up where the limousine had just been. The second bullet hit his head, a plume of bloody water, brain tissue, and bone flew up in the air, and I rode right through it. After dismounting and searching throughout Dealey Plaza, a fellow policeman made a grim discovery. Bob, you got something on your lip, and he took his finger and wiped it off my lip, and it was a piece of Kennedy's 
brain and his skull bone. One of the areas searched by Hargis and the rest of the officers was the patch of ground in front of and to the right of the Kennedy limousine. Yeah, I coined the phrase uh, grassy knoll. It's just that grassy bang going up uh, over the triple underpass. All of us remember where we were on November 22, 1963. The closer you were, the more vivid the memories. I'm the only living motorcycle officer that was upside the car. The memories kind of fade as time goes on. I don't think it'll ever fade. That day is marked down in my mind like nothing else. For JFK 40, I'm Alan Stone, WBAP 24-Hour News. Listen for JFK 40, the lost Kennedy tapes, at 11 a.m. Saturday, November 22nd on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years. 40 people, 40 stories. On News Talk 820, WBAP. Dallas Times Herald photographer Robert Jackson witnessed both the Kennedy and Oswald murders. His vantage point for the first was Houston Street between Main and Elm. Sitting high in the back of an open convertible's rear seat, eight cars back from the president's vehicle in the motorcade. He had been taking pictures since the president's landing at Love Field and handed off his film, some of it unexposed, to a courier waiting at the corner of Main and Houston. Seconds later, he heard three shots. Jackson was heading straight for the school book depository with no film in his camera when he saw two men in a fifth floor window pointing upward toward a window over them. And my eyes went up to that window and there was a rifle on the ledge. And I saw it draw it in really quick. Two days later, he got the photo of his career in the police station basement when Lee Harvey Oswald was brought out for transfer to the county jail. I'm looking through the camera because I see him coming out through the door, you know, escorted by two policemen. And they stepped into the clearing, and then I was aware somebody stepped out to my right really quick, two steps. And I, my first thought was somebody's getting in my way. Of course, then he fired and I fired. By the time Jackson got back to the Times-Herald, another photo of the shooting, taken by Jack Beers of the Dallas Morning News, was on the Associated Press wire, but that shot was taken just a millisecond before Jack Ruby pulled the trigger. Now it remained to be seen what Jackson had. We went into the dark room, and I remember holding it up to the light, and I remember letting out a yell. There it was, an image of Ruby lunging forward, Oswald doubled over in pain, and police detective Jim Lovell looking in horror at what was happening. Carried a wet print out to the newsroom, and then we realized that we'd beaten our competition. I think that was the most important thing. It was exciting, and uh, I remember going home that night with a big headache. The next year, Jackson's picture received the Pulitzer Prize. For JFK 40, I'm Steve Cumming, WBAP 24-Hour News. JFK 40, the Lost Kennedy Tapes, Saturday morning at 11 on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories on News Talk 820, WBAP. Forty years ago, Tarrant County Judge Tom Vandergriff was just beginning his political career as mayor of Arlington. On the morning of November 22, 1963, he was invited to a breakfast here at the Hotel Texas, now the Radisson, in downtown Fort Worth. That's the place where President John F. Kennedy would give his final speech. I'm glad to be here in uh, Jim Wright City, about uh, 35... Uh... Hours later, of course, President Kennedy would be assassinated. The fact that his assassin had been in our house... Uh, not too long before that time, uh, absolutely uh, numbs me. Just over a year before Kennedy's assassination, the mother of the man accused of killing the president helped Mrs. Vandegriff in the week following the birth of the couple's fourth child. Nurse Marguerite Oswald had mentioned her son to the Vandegriffs before. I well remember her telling us about her son and the difficulty he'd gotten into and the uh, Russian bride he'd brought back home with him. Through Marguerite, Mrs. Vandergriff had offered Lee Harvey Oswald and his wife a high chair for their new baby. He was a rather quiet person. I remember his being at our house that night when they came out for the high chair. He, he was very quiet. That was the judge's first and last meeting with Oswald, but Marguerite kept in contact in the months following the assassination. She um, did talk to me, and of course she was sure her son was innocent and expressed those feelings uh, to me. Despite Marguerite's strong belief that her son was innocent, Judge Vandergriff believes differently. There doesn't seem to be any doubt that 
he was the uh, assassin. For JFK 40, I'm Ellie Hogue, WBAP 24-Hour News. JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes. Seven hours of WBAP recordings from November 22nd, 1963. Played back real time, Saturday morning at 11 on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories on News Talk 820, WBAP. There are so many what-ifs that can be asked about the events leading up to November 22, 1963. What if President Kennedy hadn't insisted on a convertible? What if the weather had been bad? What if Ruth Payne had not met Lee and Marina Oswald? Ruth Payne was living in Irving. She was a Quaker housewife who happened to know how to speak Russian. And in early 1963, Ruth Payne was bored. A friend of hers in Dallas said to her, I'm giving a party on February 22nd, and I think you'd want to come. There's this young fellow who's going to be at it who spent some time in the Soviet Union and who came home with a Russian wife. And here's a chance for you to speak Russian. Thomas Mallon is the author of the book Mrs. Payne's Garage and the Murder of John F. Kennedy. He says Ruth Payne became enamored of Marina Oswald and eventually invited Lee and Marina to move into her garage, which had been converted into an apartment. She even got Lee a job at the Texas School Book Depository. Lee Oswald didn't drive, so he would spend his weeknights in a boarding house near the depository and then travel home to Marina in Irving on weekends. But on Thursday night, November 21st, Ruth Payne was surprised to see Lee in her front yard visiting with his wife. The real reason he was out there that night was to pick up his rifle and to wrap it in brown paper and to take it in to the depository with him the next morning, claiming it was curtain rods. But Thomas Mallon says Ruth never knew that Lee had a rifle, and certainly never knew that Oswald had tried to kill segregationist General Edwin Walker in April of 1963. If Marina had imparted that fact to Ruth, not only do I think Oswald would not have been welcome, but I think Ruth would have gone to the Dallas police. If that had happened, somebody might have killed President Kennedy in Dallas, but I do not believe it would have been Lee Harvey Oswald, and I do not believe it would have happened from the window of the Texas the school book depository. For JFK 40, I'm Dan Potter, WBAP 24-Hour News. JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes. Seven hours of WBAP recordings from November 22nd, 1963. Played back real time, Saturday morning at 11 on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people. 40 stories on News Talk 820 WBAP. She was seated next to her husband, Texas Governor John Connolly, as President John F. Kennedy's limousine made its way through Dallas, headed to the Trade Mart. Nellie Connolly's memories are vivid. November 22, 1963 had been a glorious day with huge, friendly crowds greeting President and Mrs. Kennedy. The Texas First Lady was exuberant. So I turned around and said, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. The celebratory mood turned to terror in a heartbeat. And I heard this loud noise that I was not certain what it was, but I turned toward the noise. When I turned, I could look right at the president, and I saw his hands fly up to his neck. John, who is sitting in front of him, turned to his left, and this takes seconds and the second shot went through John Connolly, and he said, my God, they're going to kill us all. Their black limo was under siege. There was a third shot. The car was covered. We were covered with a bloody matter that I assume was the president's head. As the limousine sped toward the hospital, Nellie Connolly cradled her husband across her lap. And all I said to him was, be still. It'll be all right. I just whispered that to him all the way. At Parkland, there was little comfort. She was kept outside the emergency room, where doctors worked to save her husband's life. Never, ever felt so alone as I felt standing there wondering what was going on. And now, 40 years later, another effect lingers. I was afraid for my family for the first time. And I have been conscious of looking over my shoulder ever since. For JFK 40, Rick Hadley, WBAP 24-Hour News. JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes. Seven hours of WBAP recordings from November 22nd, 1963. Played back real time, Saturday morning at 11 on News Talk 820, WBAP. JFK 40, 40 years, 40 people, 40 stories. 
on News Talk 820 WBAP. I was born in New Orleans in 1939. For a short length of time during my childhood, I lived in Texas and in New York. Lee Harvey Oswald did most of his growing up in Louisiana. Then my family and I moved to Texas. Then I entered the United States Marine Corps in 1956. His fellow Marines would nickname him Oswaldkovich for his apparent support of communism. He became secretary of the New Orleans chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. We support the idea of an independent revolution in the Western Hemisphere free from American intervention. Despite all his criticism for U.S. policy in Latin America, Oswald seemed to hold no great animosity for President Kennedy. On November 22, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was living in Dallas and working at the Texas School Book Depository. Then... Police radios are carrying that the president has been hit. Attention all squad. The suspect in the shooting at Elm and Houston is reported to be an unknown white male, approximately 30, slender build, Police soon captured Lee Harvey Oswald. Captain Will Fritz was confident about Oswald's guilt. I can tell you that this case is cinched. This man killed the president. Oswald himself proclaimed his innocence. These people have given me a hearing without legal representation. I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. But before Oswald could be tried in the killing... He's been shot. shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. Jack Ruby was convicted and sentenced to death today for the murder of accused presidential assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald's killing has helped to fuel the greatest conspiracy theories about a crime few can accept even four decades later. The Oswald interview heard in this segment was recorded a few months before the assassination by a New Orleans radio station. For JFK 40, Jim Ryan, WBAP 24-Hour News. JFK 40, The Lost Kennedy Tapes. Seven hours of WBAP recordings from November 22nd, 1963. Played back real time, Saturday morning at 11 on News Talk 820, WBAP.